Hi there, come on in. This next half hour we'll have most of the elements of our usual Michigan Outdoor Show, but coupled with the 60 minutes of Big Buck Night, we have an hour and a half of Michigan Outdoors coming your way this evening. We're gonna to touch on the subject of why some sportsmen have seen bigger than average racks this past deer season. We'll also hear from Governor Engler about the reorganization he mandated for the DNR. Despite the dissension you may have been hearing, this reorganization will stand, it's as good as done, and it's good for sportsmen. We have a great recipe for venison finger rolls and more, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost, it's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Smoke, how'd you get all those bones in that chicken soup? I learned how to can last year, but I forgot how to bone at the same time. <laughs> hey, see. <laughs> no, just wondering, just to get things started. Did you get a buck? Well, we did in archery season, but not on this, uh, you know, this is the easy part of the hunt, really. Okay, so we're well, we not, got, how, how, many, how many guys got bucks here? Hands up. Oh, Hands I mean, it was down. a great, Zach, congratulations. Thank you. You got the only spike in camp. Mm, I don't know. I thought was there, there was another, one other. Another, another spike there? Yep, only spike opening day. But yeah. congratulations to you, too. Yeah, why? Yeah, I'll brag about that funny. <laughs> you don't have to help me on that one. <laughs> Let's get down here to Mickey Mike Cell, owner of the Mike Cell Ranch. How's this stack up, Mike? Pretty good. Nine bucks in third day. Pretty good compared to other years. Sure. Well, these bucks, I mean, in years past, when we've well, been here, they were a lot smaller. Oh, yeah. Usually we have, there's five or six spike horns. We only have two spike horns, uh, three eight points. It's been a good year. What's your record on spike horns in one year? One year we had, what was it? 17 and a Nine in one day. Yeah, nine, nine, nine spike horns in one day, in opening day. All spike horns. Yeah, about four years ago. Three days. Mm -hmm. So what do you make of this? Well, I think the, the deer herd's in pretty good shape up here, except we have too many does and fawns. Yeah. Well, I didn't see all that many. But look at Captain Amel Dean. This is the captain, how he looks in hunting camp. <laughs> You're a surly looking son of a gun. Thank you. You know that? That's a, that's a compliment coming from you, you know that? <laughs> that's the nicest thing you said to me in days. Yeah, that's right. Well, you, you got a, what, eight point? Got an eight point, yes. Eight mm -hmm. point, well, great. Congratulations. We'll get back and get, yeah, get a look at some of these racks here. Uh, of course, mine, I'll brag plenty about that. That's uh, next to the end there. But geez, these were beautiful racks. It was a great deer camp. It really was. Good yeah. time. Yes, indeed. But those bones and smoked oh, soup. That was terrible. I, 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 <laughs> I, don't, understand. I don't understand. Yeah. Deer camp is not over yet. <laughs> more surprises. That's right. Deer camp involves a lot more than just deer hunting. It's a week when a group of guys can get together and kick back, cook their own meals, get to know each other outside of the workplace, and have fun. It's a great equalizer. But the objective, at least on paper, is to get a deer, hopefully a big buck. Mickey Mikesell said that a few years ago, they got nine bucks on an opening day, all of them spike horns. And for that season, the hunters in camp took a record 17 spike bucks. Now that's a lot of small deer. But why do deer populations vary so much from year to year? Well, actually it's a predictable phenomenon. Mild winters like we've had the past few years have higher temperatures, which makes the deer less stressed and they don't need as much food. At the same time, less snow and ice in a mild winter makes more food available to the deer. And all in all, in a mild winter, more deer survive in healthy condition and healthy does have more fawns. Twins and triplets are common among healthy deer after a mild winter. And when reproduction goes up, Regulated hunting is the only practical tool wildlife biologists have to harvest these extra deer and keep the population from eating itself out of house and home. A high population that's short on food starts a cycle of starvation, which isn't pretty. It's nature at its cruelest. And with starvation comes a lot of habitat destruction because the starving animals try to eat everything in sight. That's why modern hunting is practical. It provides game meat for people to eat, prevents habitat destruction, and prevents the waste of starving deer that would rot in the woods. A large number of deer in the woods isn't necessarily the goal of wildlife management. The goal is to maintain a population that's as large as possible as long as it's as healthy as possible so it stays in balance with its food supply. Keeping a population constant means that each year, as many animals have to die as are born. For every fawn that comes to life in the spring, 
Another deer must die or else that population will grow. And when the population grows, we have more car deer accidents, we have more crop damage, we have more overbrowsing of cedar swamps, and when we hit a harsh winter, we have widespread starvation of deer. So the primary objective of hunting from a wildlife manager's point of view is to keep the population of deer under control. But within this goal, there can be other objectives such as growing larger deer or bucks with larger, more symmetrical racks. Mike Farentino owns 4,000 acres adjacent to Mickey Mike Sell's property in Clare. That's the area I hunted this season. Mike dropped by the Mike Sell camp several times during the first few days. He was wondering what kind of bucks we were seeing. It's been his theory since he bought the 4,000 acres four years ago that by taking only the small bucks with the scrubby racks, which is the only deer he allowed to be taken by his hunters in the past four years, that they'd leave deer with better racks to reproduce. After four years, the Ferentino plan seems to have worked. More bigger bucks with symmetrical racks were taken this season from these two hunting camps than any year in recent memory. Big bucks are always a fascination to hunters and to anybody who likes to see wild creatures. We're going to explore this subject a little more this winter, talking with Mike Ferentino and wildlife biologists there may be ways that Michigan can develop more bigger bucks than we have now. That's an exciting thought, don't you think? In our new Outdoor Digest magazine, I did an analysis of our Williams Gun Sight Hunting Award since 1984, the points versus the spread. I was curious as to where the big bucks came from. So where did those big bucks, of which counties reported bucks with antlers of 20 points or more? Well, these big boys are found throughout the Upper Peninsula. Very few in the northern lower. This is where most of the deer in the state are concentrated. The rest of the 20 point plus bucks are in the southern part of the state and the thumb. But what about the bucks with the widest outside spreads, 26 inches plus? Well, fewer in the UP, not too many in the northern lower. Again, concentrated in southern Michigan. That's where the big wide racks come from. I ran another statistic. What about six point bucks that have 18 inch spreads or more? Well, none in the UP. A few in the northern lower, the rest of them in the southern counties. This data in our new outdoor digest is kind of interesting. I've been called a DNR basher for the hard-hitting investigative reports I've done over the past couple of months, and I really concentrated on these these past fall, showing really the mismanagement of sportsmen's money by our DNR. Why did I do this? Because I knew one of two things was going to happen. Either the legislature was going to make moves to reorganize the DNR, or the governor was going to issue an order. Well, I'm happy to report Governor Engler has issued a sweeping executive order to reorganize the Department of Natural Resources. I think this is the most positive step for sportsmen in the past 20 years. And last Friday, Governor Engler invited me down to answer some of my questions about his reorganization. Why didn't you let the legislature, or why didn't you work through your Senate connections in the legislature or something to, to change the DNR rather than just issuing this edict? Well, first of all, we haven't changed any of the laws. What we're trying to do is change the way the laws are carried out, the way the functions and the responsibilities are performed. And I had talked about splitting the department into two separate departments, a natural resources department and environmental protection department. And people said, give it a chance, let it work. And we talked about the role of the commission, the commission appointed by the governor that hires the director that actually picks the management of the department. Well, everywhere I go, people talk to me about problems, concerns they've got, and they come from all across the spectrum. They can't get this site cleaned up. They can't find out about this regulation. What's going to happen about the fisheries? What's going to be done with the game? What about hunting here? What about forestry there? And so I acted to be very clear who's in charge, who has what responsibility. And I think I've strengthened the role of the public. What we've done is, through an executive order, put the commission in charge of the director, have the director be the final authority on issuing the permits, on writing the rules, taken all of these boards, commissions, committees, some 19 of them, 10 that hadn't even met in more than a year, and said, wait a minute, what they're really doing is obscuring who's making the decision, who's the staff that's in charge, and let's let the people meet the decision makers on the staff. The people pay for this department. Mm -hmm. Let's let the department carry out their responsibilities. But how is that going to work? How uh, uh, are my friends and, and the groups of hunters and fishermen 
going to have input. Right now, a lot of the sportsmen feel like they don't have input. It's certain environmental groups seem to be running the show. Well, that's the way the boards and the commissions, unfortunately, have functioned in the past. This is a bill that Senator Ehlers introduced. This is the codification of all of the laws involving and affecting the environment in the state of Michigan. It's 500 pages. Hmm. And they've, they're scattered throughout the law books. And one of the problems that a citizen has, anybody that's not familiar on a day-to-day, -day, almost as a lawyer, uh, with the functionings and the operations, how do you figure out who's in charge, who's on first, who's making the decisions? And what we've said is there has to be a simple process that everybody can understand. So you've uh, simplified the DNR. Absolutely, and it's going to be a, a more accountable process. You know, I go out around the state, they don't say, John, this commission or this board or that person did something. They ask me, why don't you solve this problem? Well, I mm -hmm. need to have a process that I can understand as governor, and I think it's one that the public ought to be able to have access to. They're going to have input. Input's guaranteed. Every rule that's dis considered, every permit that's considered, there's a way, and we're going to work to even make that widely understood by everyone so they know mm -hmm. how to access it. And now when the decision's made by the department, the appeal is to the commission. So if you're unhappy, there's seven individuals appointed by the governor who can sit in judgment. They can reverse it or well, they can modify it. But what about this, this criticism is going all over in the press. All of the writers are saying he's ruined it, he's taken public input out of the process. Well, I think that remains to be seen and yeah, I mean, the proof will be just, in the pudding. That it, is simply not accurate. I believe that we've strengthened the role of the public. The public accountability will be greater than it's been in the past and the process is going to work better. And that's the important thing. I mean, are the fisheries going to get better? Is the hunting going to be better? Is the regulation of the same improved? Are we protecting the environment? Are we uh, balancing the resources correctly? Those are the decisions, and I want the commission to be setting policy, and I want the department to be implementing the policy. And, and so who do, who do I go to representing the Outdoors Club who's upset that the fisheries have gone down by 90% in the Great Lakes, the, the salmon? Who, we, who do we talk we to? We go right to the commission, and we say, what's our policy on this? What's the department doing? The commission's going to turn and say, Mr. Director, answer that question. He's going to respond. The commission's going to say, that's not good enough. We want this and that done. This is the policy. So you've shortened up, you've taken out absolutely, a lot of little steps. Absolutely. And I, I think that's very important. I mean, when we talk about public accountability, what's important is public knowledge, public access to the decision makers. And so uh, what we've had is a, an incredibly intricate and complex maze that only a very, very few have been able to master. Mm -hmm. Frequently those with paid staffs or paid themselves to do that. And, uh, you know, for the average hunter or fisherman or sportswoman out there, you know, I'm a part-time, I'm, I'm working, I'm earning my living, mm -hmm. and then this is what I do for recreation, this is my enjoyment in life, and I don't have all this time to hire a lobbyist, and what I want to do is if I've got a problem, I want to know where I can go. And you ought to be able to go to a legislator, you ought to be able to go to the commission, you ought to be able to get answers, and I'm going to make sure the department's going to be responsive. I'm sure our DNR will be more responsive to the public and to sportsmen instead of just the environmental extremist groups who have been in control for the past few years. Now next week, Governor Engler is going to talk about uh, DNR Director Raleigh Harms and also about the future of the DNR in the governor's eyes. I predict good times are ahead for sportsmen on our DNR. We've got a venison finger rolls recipe from Robert Perkins, and finger rolls are very popular right now with the international foods. Well, this was popular among our judges in the recipe contest right. last uh, uh, February yep. or March. And going to cook cabbage, and it's got all the ingredients that, of course, all the finger rolls have. Except, got, except cat. <laughs> yes, thank I, goodness. Well, whatever they use at the Korean and uh, Chinese restaurants. No, right. I, no, I don't mean that. It's, uh, <laughs> Just going to use some burger, and you go ahead and fry this separately from while the cabbage is cooking. But in and China, they would use. <laughs> yes, they would. Yes. Yeah. Onions, Worcestershire sauce, garlic, salt and pepper, uh, that's lawrence, and, and some peanut butter. Now, I was really surprised, and I think this is a secret ingredient that goes into the uh, finger rolls. Hmm. And then bean sprouts, and you're going to cook it or just mix it all together. And then it goes into your finger roll wrappings. Uh, this is this is an egg roll? Is this yes. what we're talking about? Yes. Your now, Chinese egg roll with, with venison. Right. And there's a secret to these. You can go ahead and make, mix your meat ahead of time, but don't 
put it into your wrappings until you're ready to use it. We found that out the hard way because they will stick together. I don't care what you do to them. They're kind of kind of like a glue or something? Yes, they, it is. Hmm. And then you just seal the edges with a little bit of egg and then deep fry them. And it doesn't take very long, about a minute to a minute and a half to each side. Well, I, I hope these are big enough for our <laughs> big eater. <laughs> <laughs> that, General that, consensus you know, is. That's fantastic. One of the things I like to do, you know, with the egg rolls, and this is a good recipe to do this with, is you, is you cook them up, put them in aluminum foil, and take them out with your deer honey. Mm -hmm. And then start a, little, mm -hmm. start a little fire up around yeah. noontime, put them over, warm them up inside that aluminum foil. That's one of the best treats you mm. can have Be out in the woods. Those little heaters, you know, those little propane heaters? Excellent. Yeah. It's not yep. the way I'd do it. <laughs> You know, what I'd do is I'd uh, get up in the morning and I'd cook these for breakfast <laughs> and I'd have them all gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd take something else for lunch. <laughs> this or is, something. This, uh, this sauce and on that, here. And the oh. duck sauce really makes this recipe. It's a duck sauce? Yep, that's what it's called. It's uh, hmm. prepared. Oh, it is excellent. You know, I like it better, I think, than the sweet and sour stuff you well. get at the Chinese restaurants. Mm -hmm. Excellent use oh, of venison. Yeah. Yep. And mm -hmm. there's peanut butter in here, and I think that is the secret ingredient to the egg rolls. Well, yeah. Because mm -hmm. mm. yeah. you, you, you can taste the meat in there. You can mm -hmm. taste that venison, and it's a compliment to everything else that's in the recipe. Right. This is, this is terrific and so, so creative. I like the, whatever the shell is. That's just the egg roll skins. Egg roll mm -hmm. skins. They're great. Very crispy. Peanut butter in there, huh? Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I think I might take one with me and, and just, and just go with pocket. it and put it in my pocket <laughs> yeah. and have it later. Venison finger rolls was one of our October-November recipes, which we didn't squeeze in one of those shows, but it is in our October-November Outdoor Digest magazine. If you quick guide report, there is ice in the Upper Peninsula. People are ice fishing with snowmobiles and ice shanties, but if you get out there, be careful. This first ice is always a little bit tricky. If you can get outdoors, it's a great place to be. See you next week.